addition to research institutions, the One Ocean Hub also includes more than 30 partners, uh, including UN agencies such as UN Doalos, uh, but also the Food and Agriculture Organization, the UN Environment Program, uh, the UNESCO uh, Inter um, International Oceanographic Commission. And so we are, we are very privileged to work very closely with them and understand, discuss with them um, in what ways research can really respond and complement the efforts that are made at the UN level, uh, as well as by other partners, governments, uh, NGOs, um, and other groups uh, to make sure that we all become much more um, effective partners uh, in addressing the multiple threats um, that are affecting the ocean. Um, we, we've started our work quite recently, earlier this year, uh, but many of the colleagues um, uh, across the hub have worked for many years um, in the oceans in ocean sciences and around ocean governance. Uh, some are applying for the first time, their expertise and disciplines to the ocean, and we all have been learning a lot from each other. And so what we'll try to do in this session and also the sister session on social sciences at the, social, uh, at the science policy interface is really trying to understand and discuss with you how we can, how we can learn from each other, how can international lawyers, sociologists, uh, anthropologists, um, learn from the marine sciences and work together more closely and more effectively, and vice versa, how colleagues in the marine sciences and the arts can work more with more closely and more strategically with um, lawyers and sociologists and economists um, to really uh, shape ocean governance in a way that is better able to address multiple threats to the ocean and work across scales from the international level to the local level with everything else in between and how we can really connect discussions at the UN level or at government level with the reality on the ground and the experiences um, and lessons learned uh, on the coast, on the sea um, of the people that are most closely dependent um, on the ocean. So without further ado, I will briefly introduce um, the three colleagues who will be chairing and being discussants uh, for today's session. Um, and then our colleague Kira, who will be chairing, will introduce our incredible speaker for today. Um, so one of our colleagues, uh, well, Kira, who, who just appeared, Kira Erwin, is senior researcher at the Urban Future Center of Durban University of Technology in South Africa. Uh, she's a sociologist and she will be chairing today's session and also contribute her own reflections on how um, the marine science expertise and experience um, that Kerry Sink will share with us speaks to the themes um, and the issues that she's been working on uh, for quite a long while. Uh, the other colleague that will be with us is Sean Rees. Um, Sean is a senior research fellow uh, at the School of Biological and Marine Sciences at Plymouth University in the UK. Uh, she's done quite a lot of work at the science policy interface herself um, and is an expert in ecosystem services. Uh, and the third colleague that we're really privileged to have with us is Dr. Dylan McGarry. He's a senior researcher at the Environmental Learning Research Center um, at the university currently known as Rhodes University in South Africa. He's the director of the Institute of Uncanny Justice and one of the co-directors of the One Ocean Hub. Uh, so without further ado, I'll, I'll leave the floor to Kira to introduce our speaker today. Um, and I'm, I'm very, very excited um, for, for her to take the floor very soon. Hi everyone, so lovely to be here with you all. Um, I've got the honor of introducing Kerry and I'm going to read it because there's a lot to say about Kerry Sink and we're very privileged to have her with us today. Professor Kerry Sink is a principal scientist at the South African National Biodiversity Institute and a research associate at Nelson Mandela University. She leads the National Biodiversity Assessment with a long-term investment in the classification, description and mapping of marine ecosystems. Kerry's greatest investment, and you'll see the slide up on the screen, has been in supporting the establishment of a new network of marine protected areas in South Africa. She began this work in 2006, and 13 years later, in 2019, 20 new MPAs were declared, representing a tenfold increase in South Africa's ocean space in a single step. Kerry was supported by the Pew Fellowship in Marine Conservation, and her work in this area has received a Distinguished Service Award from the Society for Conservation Biology. 
Kerry is very passionate about capacity building and development in marine science and management, both in South Africa and beyond. And we are very happy to have her with us today. I'm going to speak to you briefly after Kerry's presentation and then let the panelists give some reflection and we will have time for questions and answers as well. So today Kerry will take us on a journey exploring some of the turning points in her personal and professional experience, a journey I'm very much looking forward to. So Kerry, I'm handing over to you. Hi everyone, apologies for the technical challenge. Thank you so much for inviting me to share my experiences today and the opportunity to reflect. My personal journey has been a journey of increasing depth. I started my, careers, my career on the rocky shores of northern KwaZulu-Natal and this is a really accessible ecosystem and I got to study the patterns and dynamics between the different species, the different communities, and also the human dependencies on these systems, laying a great environment, a great groundwork before moving into a far more inaccessible environment. And it was really the discovery of a fish, and that fish is the coelacanth, uh, a living population of coelacanths, many, many years later, after they first became known to science that enabled South Africa to move into deeper water. And we were able to hire a remotely operated vehicle like this, which allows you to take a walk on the sea floor. And it's an incredible privilege to experience these ecosystems. And it's, it's a unique opportunity to have these colors and shapes and this diversity revealed before your eyes. There's a lot of anticipation when you're going to go and explore an area for the very first time. In my case, I'd done years of work using computers and spatial planning and desktop analyses. And so one of the real highlights for me was I had identified this area in Amatola on our south coast as an important area, but we had never seen it before. And we sent down this underwater robot. It's kind of like an underwater drone. And the lights just let, lit up this entire forest of, of lace corals. And these lace corals are really very, very fragile. And the beauty and fragility just blew me away. One of the special experiences I've had is to work with marine biologist Lisa Levin. And Lisa took the time and effort to come to sea with us in South Africa and work offshore and help us learn. And one of the things she did was to teach us to look more closely. And so she showed us by collecting soft corals in our, in our deep water, not just the brittle stars and the worms in them, but the eyes of future fish. It's one thing to read a scientific paper about the role of coral habitats as nursery areas, but it's another thing to really experience that by looking down a microscope and seeing the eggs in the arms of a soft coral. Offshore work has its high points and low points. And um, one of the greatest kind of seesaw moments I had was going from first discovering very accidentally cold water corals in South Africa's museum. Walking through the worm section of the museum, these corals caught my eye because I used to work on shallow, on shallow corals. And I picked them up and on the label, they had come from 970 meters. And I had read a lot about deep cold water coral communities in the, in the Northern hemisphere, but I didn't imagine that we had these complex three-dimensional structures inside South Africa's waters. So I was really excited to go and learn more. We sampled these habitats. Sorry, the we sampled these habitats. Let me just admit all. By dredge uh, from 900 meters, but South Africa doesn't yet have the capacity 
to work below 700 meters with visual work. But in 2016, I got the opportunity to work in one of our first proposed coral reserves at a depth of 300 meters. And I was so excited for that experience, like what am I going to see? But what we found was that this complex three-dimensional structure of the corals had been broken down into a field of coral rubble. Now, the most likely reason for this is, is trawling, but we can't rule out climate change because cold water corals are very sensitive to ocean warming, deoxygenation, and ocean acidification. There are many mysteries at sea. So, you know, just like I said, we don't know what killed the coral and we, we're always encountering new mysteries. One of my favorite ones was this species. So this is a species of what we call foraminiferans or forams. And um, it's basically like an armored amoeba, a very simple single-celled animal that can secrete the shell. These are some of the largest ones in the world. And amazingly, when I worked to identify this species, um, I had help from, from a guy who works on, on seashells. And this species is actually recorded as extinct. But what you can see here, it's very much actively processing the sediment and particulate organic matter. And indeed, these species have shown to be important in cycling nutrients on the seafloor. They play a key role in the carbon cycle. Another mystery was these mounds of shell grit and coral that I was seeing on the shelf edge in the Isamangaliso marine protected area. I was so excited about our coelacanth discovery that I took up mixed gas diving and um, in our explorations we'd see these mounds and all the divers would ask me, the marine biologists in the group, but what makes the mounds? And it took us nine years to find out that this little fish, it's a, it's a tile fish, keeps, um, it actually goes and fetches each little piece of coral rubble and builds a home. And then normally, especially if you approach with an ROV or a submarine or something noisy, it ducks into its home. I find the, the biology of fish is completely fascinating. Um, but it's a, a couple of fish, a couple of individual fish that I've actually had the privilege of studying for a long time that have given me the deepest insights. Jesse is the first coelacanth that was known to divers from Sedwana Bay. She was discovered in the year 2000. And for these 20 years, I've tracked these individual fish. We have 34 individuals. This one here is actually Noah, uh, recognized by the arc on his side. I try to give them names so that when I see them, I'll recognize them immediately. This is Eric Eyelashes, and Eric Eyelashes gave me an incredible peek into his life because um, we managed to tag this fish. The, the brave divers put a tag on this fish that stayed for nine months attached to Eric, popping up nine months later. And then by satellite, we got minute by minute log of the depth of Eric Eyelashes. And I got to know that Pretty regularly, he comes out of his cave. We think, we can't see what he's doing, but we think it's a cave because it's at a depth where we know there's a cave where he spends a lot of time out of the cave and then travels up and down as shallow as 70 meters and as deep as 400 meters, returning at dawn um, to have a steady time and then every evening going about his business. One of the animals that was even harder to find than a coelacanth was this gelatinous network of tubes. This is an acorn worm or hemichordate. And it's famous because it's been found to have a compound that's amongst the most, compound, most potent compounds ever tested against cancer. The thing is that when this animal um, made it into publications by chemists, they reported that they had collected it by scuba diving. So for years and years, we had been looking in the, long, in the wrong place to find this animal. And it's only recently been revealed that this species lives only in the South African deep sea, as far as we know. And um, it's our sole responsibility to look after it. And, we're really excited about this discovery now because we can move forward with, with drug discovery. One of the more interesting surprises I had was actually made on the shore. 
And that's when I was walking through what we call a muti market. That's a, a market where plants and animals are sold for use in traditional medicine and ritual. And I was amazed to find that the bypatch species from our prawn troll fishery were being collected by deckhands and sold for use in traditional medicine and magic. This was certainly not a group of stakeholders who I'm, I had consulted in, in deciding and working towards marine protected areas. One of the groups of stakeholders who took the most time from me and indeed uh, taught me the most lessons were the offshore oil and gas industry. Uh, this picture was, was, is, was made possible by, by a data set collected by one of the petroleum companies. This I call Mount Marrick. And, and we're hoping to visit this feature for the first time. So this is a future moment that I'm really looking forward to on the One Ocean Hub cruise. So you can see the seamount and you can see these incredible submarine canyons that incise into our western margin. And the relationships with oil and gas are important because a scientist like myself and the geoscientists of the country can only dream of the resources to collect such a data set. These negotiations, however, are not easy. Um, all the women in this group are from the Marine Protected Area team and the men are from three different petroleum companies. The particular moment that stands out for me was a moment when I was visited by a team of petroleum executives discussing the proposed Namaqualand Marine Protected Area first identified for protection in South Africa when I was four years old. The executive walked into the room and unfurled his map and he started his sentence with the words right and I knew that something was going to happen and he said to me you've got your biodiversity area map and now we have our map and he said I'm calling this the heaven and earth map and basically the green area, we don't care if you try to put a protected area there, but the red area will move heaven and earth to stop you. Discussing this with my husband over dinner that evening, we agreed that this was a little bit intimidating, but I explained to him that the critical thing was that we had finally reached the point where we had the fine scale sharing of priorities. And this unlocked four decades of negotiation for protected area establishment. The day that I think I really felt the full weight of the implications of some of the work that we do in terms of impacts on fishermen was a very misty morning in Saldana Bay on our west coast. And there I went aboard a vessel, a very large trawler that does a lot of fishing in the Cape Canyon area. Now, I was trying to work out how do we protect the most sensitive part of the canyon head whilst, while having the least impact on the fishermen who depend on that productive area. And so we were sharing tracks. But there was just this moment of quiet when, when the captain of this vessel turned to me and he had these piercing blue-green eyes and he said to me, Kerry, this canyon is my life. Sometimes in the difficult moments, we turn to our children for inspiration. And when I first had to leave my son to go to sea, he was just three years old. I explained to him that I wouldn't be there to tuck him in that night and um, for many nights to come and why and what I was doing. And with the wisdom of three-year-olds, he looked at me and he said, mommy, that's good because if you don't look after the seabed, the fish will have nowhere to sleep. So I'd really like to thank you for the reflections um, and the reflective opportunity that this, this for putting this talk together has given me over the last 13 years. And I think that one of my, my key reflections is really that we need more than science. We need to have a deep appreciation of human dependencies and of all the connections, including the spiritual, 
and emotional connections that we have with the ocean. But we also need more science. And um, in closing, I'd really like to thank all of my collaborators and all of my students and also all of my stakeholders for sharing this journey with me and for the lessons. Thank you. Kerry, thank you so much. Uh, sure, incredible. We need more science and we need more than science. I'm going to ask everyone, if you don't mind, just to take 30 seconds, so just half a minute, just to reflect on the images, the stories that Kerry shared. And if you could, in the chat, just type a few words that immediately come to mind. Um, if I could ask you not to send it straight away, if you don't mind, but to hold it. And in 30 seconds, I'm going to ask us all to share. So take a moment to reflect. And then in the chat, just a few words on your immediate reactions to the talk, please. And if you've got your responses ready, if you could press send, we'd love to see what they are in the chat, please. Oh, fantastic. There's some lovely responses coming through. And I think, Kerry, that the power of storytelling using both photos and experience is really important to think about when we think about ocean governance and what it means to work in this area. And I just wanted to share with you one of the moments when I've seen your presentation around how powerful maps are and the mapping of our ocean and what, a, what an incredible tool it is to help us both negotiate for protection and also for resources. But your point too, about who are the people around the table who either have the resources to create these sorts of maps and the technology to create these maps and which people are not sitting around the table and which kind of meanings of the ocean are not mapped. So how do cultural and social and economic livelihood meanings get mapped into these spaces as well is really, really important. I'm going to hand over briefly, and thank you, keep your comments coming, they're really useful to see. I'm gonna hand over to Sean, and just to get her reflections on what it's like to listen to Kerry's stories. Sean, over to you. Great, thank you. Well, it's been, it's been fascinating um, learning about Kerry's story. And my first reflection is that for natural scientists and many of the natural scientists I work with, I work in a biology department at the university, is that much of science is linked to uh, discovery and wonder and, and majesty. And for me as a social scientist and economist, I, I, I too am really amazed by these discoveries. And then from my perspective, when I look more closely, as Kerry describes this need to look more closely into your own science, I start to wonder what they do. And then I think about how do these ecosystems then cross over with the human system? And then why do they matter? And quite often when I look around a room of stakeholders, I think to myself, what's that hook that's gonna make those people feel that an ocean ecosystem actually matters to them? Why should they care? So Kerry showed us the, the mosaic interaction between the living and the non-living components of the ecosystem do they function to support these flows of ecosystem services those livelihoods and by ecosystem services i mean those benefits that humans derive from ecological systems is how we make a living it's the food that we eat and it's the air that we breathe 
And in the deep sea, just like in coastal systems, we can discover those complex places that provide nursery, habitat, refuge areas for marine life, including commercial fish species, things that enable the food chain, but more hidden in the mud and the sands, perhaps the less, what we could describe as the, the less charismatic places, are those ecosystem functions that support global processes through shifting, storing, bioturbating uh, carbon, for example. And when we think about precautionary protection of deep sea habitats, we have to think about the pockets of rare and the scarce and unique, um, but also the common and the functional and perhaps even the boring, uh, the muds and the sediments, because global processes such as carbon and the nutrient cycle are supported by ocean ecosystems and they're connected across vast scales, a scale at which current governance and management frameworks may not be fit for a global community. Um, as an economist, I reflect on Kerry's presentation in terms of value, how we value and, and what we value of those benefits from nature, those ecosystem services. It's important to the process of how decisions are made, of how we use or benefit or explo exploit different ecosystems. And it's really just too easy to see value in meeting economic needs, such as jobs or GDP. And it's extremely challenging to create a decision-making forum where all values and value sets can be considered on an equal footing. And also to consider if the sharing of those benefits is actually fair. And Kerry demonstrated in her talk, I think the much more complex strands to value, the huge deep sea fish, which is, which is the value of existence. Uh, of time spent and how old are these fish? The value of knowledge through developing partnerships with fishermen and industry, a drug compound even to treat cancer. And we have colleagues in the One Ocean Hub who are discovering ocean value in the antibiotic properties of deep sea sponges, for example. And there are untapped reserves of knowledge and value that perhaps should be known or should definitely be known before they are altered um, or destroyed even. So my final reflection on, on Kerry's beautiful story is that we need to bring the social and the economic sciences much more closely into play. And, and Kerry describes this perfectly with her map and Kira mentioned this as well, that the heaven and earth map shows the immense power of maps in fine scale trade-offs and negotiations. Essentially someone is mapping or annexing their economic value attributed to an ecosystem. But without another means at present to map things, it, it is, we could also consider that it's a, a critical starting point in developing shared values. But we do need to go further. And through bridging ecology into the social and the economic sciences, we can derive perhaps a much more richer understanding of how ecosystems are linked to planetary health and human well-being. And then perhaps our conversations cannot be so binary between monetary economic values on one hand and conservation on the other but much more nuanced in terms of how they are linked and how we place the health and the condition of our natural environment and all its diversity in terms of the services and the benefits it provides at the absolute heart of our decision making so i'd like to thank kerry for her her talk um, and also the opportunity to to have a good think about my perspective on it Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much. And uh, absolutely, as you're talking, I'm wondering how, in thinking about value, how do we also incorporate some of the comments that are coming up on the chat? So Anas from Jordan wrote, ocean love. How do we value and map ocean love? Dil, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks so much. Um, and stuff for me as well. Nice to have a segue with Ocean Love because I think that's the thing that really stood out for me was your love, awe, and wonderful sea, um, and and also your capacity not just as a scientist to observe and and reflect and try answer questions, but your capacity also to build relationships and the relational qualities that are needed in this kind of work. Um, 
So there's these relationships with individuals. So, I mean, what really stuck out was the, the individual relationships with the more than human. So with the coelacanths themselves as individuals, their names and their very personal characters, their eyelashes or the markings that they have and being able to follow an individual fish for 20 years is, is remarkable. I mean, especially a fish so strange and, and mysterious as that. And also this line you said is that you, you said there are many mysteries at sea. And um, I think that's part of the beauty of working in this realm. Um, the mystery that you discover on shore when seeing the Muti and Magi, the Muti market for, that's used for ritual and magic and different forms of tangible and intangible heritage um, really opened up some thoughts for me around how um, there are these other dependencies. You said, you know, you wondered, you know, these were a group of people you hadn't consulted yet when building some of the parks and how, you know, it opened up a whole new place for you to explore the worldviews and questions in which a whole nother demographic has is important to the Kosa and Amazulu culture with Muti and magic is that the deep sea is a place is equivalent to heaven. Your answer here in South Africa, the ocean, especially the sea floor, there's a place where traditional healers go after they when they go to, to gain wisdom from their ancestors, it's said that they go under the sea. And the sea itself, the water itself has all these qualities and uh, healing properties and the species that come out of them are considered sacred. Um, so just a scientist recognizing and, and thinking carefully about what this means um, when building these maths is so important and something we should all be considering around the world when thinking through um, trying to create marine protected areas and, and who are the different publics that need, that have a, um, have or make meaning through the sea and this relational quality um and and what also struck for me kind of echoing kira and sean is this the power play of who isn't in the room and who is able to express their knowledge and will their perspectives and meaning making of the sea be as valuable or as uh, not as valuable will, will be listened to in the same way uh, petrochemical uh, uh, director um, would be listened to. So how, how, my big question now is how do we create groups that allows for a multi market seller and a traditional healer to have as much say in, in that map as a, as a, a, a petrochemical uh, representative. So, um, and then I also just thought that something that stood out for me is also knowing that your son was able to understand the importance of this work in such an embodied and true way um, in himself. And that the, um, the difference between scientists and children is not, not that different. And my engagement with getting to know you as a researcher, but also with other scientists I've met in this field, is that there's a genuine awe and wonder and like and often just being asking what's that and saying, I don't know we, we're so excited we can't wait to find out I find that incredibly inspiring and exciting that there are still so many mysteries that we we don't have answers to um so yeah thank you so much for that um beautiful presentation and and also uh, an example of scientists being incredible storytellers as well Thank you so much, Dylan. Um, Kerry, I'd love to let you have a quick response um, to Sean and Dylan, and then we're going to open it up to everyone to ask some more direct questions of yourself and possibly if they'd like some of the other panelists. But yeah, Kerry, perhaps you can respond and tell us what it was like to tell the stories and then to listen to people reflecting on them. Um, thanks, Kira. Yeah, it just really brought up more stories and memories for me of, of different examples um, 
and to really reflect on this balancing act. It made me think about the, the part of the ocean, the 50% of the planet that belongs to everyone. And how do you make decisions for something that belongs to everyone? And, and that's something I still wrestle with, but I, I'd love to hear from the audience. No, thanks, Kerry. Let's do that. We're going to open up for questions and answers. Um, could I ask, if you can raise your hand if you have a question. Um, and when I ask you to, to please uh, introduce yourself and turn your video on if possible, just whilst you're asking the question, it'd be lovely to see faces. And I'm going to take two questions at a time and then let Kerry or anyone else you'd like to hear from respond. Please do note that this is being recorded. I just want to call your attention to that. Um, Joe is recording for the One Ocean Hub, and I'm sure we'd be happy to share this afterwards if anyone would like the recording as well. So if you have a question, please do raise your hand, and I will open the floor up to you. No questions so far, unless I'm missing some. Ah, Elisa, yes, go ahead. I thought, I thought I'd break the ice and see if others <laughs> will follow. Uh, I think, Kerry, was, I mean, I've, I've heard your story before, but each time new thoughts, I think, come to mind. Uh, one thing that I thought was very interesting, maybe you could expand a bit more uh, for the benefit of our uh, colleagues on the call is, your experience in collaborating with um, scientists from the US and Europe. I know you mentioned in your story how significant it was for your colleague, I think from the US who came to South Africa to work with you and you know teach and learn from you. And I, and I was wondering if you have more stories about what it means to work with colleagues uh, from other countries that may have more means and um, uh, capacity to, or have been deeper than you in the oceans what has worked and what has not worked um, for you and for your own research in South Africa? Thanks, Alyssa. Yes. Um, so it, it's always something that um, we're, we're often a little bit jealous when we get to see the kind of technology that many deep sea scientists from other countries have. And indeed, when I first went to the deep sea conference, I, I I felt a bit like a fraud because the deep sea is generally defined as 200 meters and so much of my work has been in kind of the twilight zone between 100 and 200 meters not often making it into that really deep area so so that always was a bit of a discomfort for me but the the community um, is often very welcoming and the person that I was talking about Lisa Levin is someone who came out to to South Africa and gave a, a guest gave guest lectures, several guest lectures. And there were very few people who seemed to be interested from South Africa, but myself and, and the One Ocean Hub colleague, Laura Atkinson, were, were in the audience. And um, Lisa really gave us the confidence to say, she was like, no, you should be giving these lectures. You should be talking about the deep sea in your country. And we were like, no, we don't really know enough and we haven't sampled and we don't know what the things we are seeing are. And, she was so encouraging, but um, but really the the kind of game changing experience for us was when Lisa was willing to come across to South Africa and come to sea with us. And what was so important about that, and so different from the experience of a of a developing country scientist going and participating on a cruise where you get to have amazing experiences, but that technology is so out of your reach. So. So Lisa came to us and then within the constraints of our, uh, our kind of, our, our ship that we have and the equipment that we have, which is like a, a drop camera that we have, she really taught us to strengthen the science under our own conditions and our own limitations. And we have the Agalis current in South Africa and it's a formidable current. I spent many beautiful days at sea fighting the Agalis current where we can't get our equipment down. Um, and Lisa was able to share some of her more practical experience, but also to show us what different deep sea ecosystems look like, teach us to recognize seep systems. So 
it's not a common capacity development model, but really one that I think is very important. Thanks, Kerry. Thanks, Elisa, for the first question. Anyone else have questions you'd like to ask of Kerry, or perhaps you have something you'd like to share? Kerry's stories are, are frequently about relationships, and that can those can be very tricky uh, in negotiations as well. Okay, so Holly has a question for all panelists. What do you think are the barriers for people embracing the less tangible benefits of the deep sea? Thanks, Holly. I note that. I'm going to let Andrea uh, have a question as well, and then we'll come back to both of those. Andrea, I see your hand up. If you'd like to give us your question, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, good. Gary, thank you very much. First, I just wanted to ask you uh, if you are aware of uh, the Balam statement that was signed between Brazil, South Africa, and the European Union on uh, research collaboration. And deep sea is certainly one of the areas that uh, we are looking into. And then can uh, that is a framework that can uh, really help you uh, to develop further uh, collaborations into that. Uh, the other question that I have to you is uh, I'm a national from Brazil and we are in the same capacity as uh, scientifically speaking and I, 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 I used to work for the Ministry of Science and now I'm developing a thesis on science diplomacy exactly because of uh, the reasons that you, sure, you shared so one of the issues that we always had is that usually oil and gas companies, they have all the data that we would die for uh, to get our hands on. And it's very hard to get them uh, to release the data or to work together with the scientific community. And by you nodding, I understand that you have uh, the same issue in South Africa, so I thought. Uh, but, uh, don't you think that the power of uh, I've been learning a lot from so social sciences and now on uh, how to develop better science to policy interface in a sense that the even pressures can be given into the companies in the private sector uh, towards more collaboration. What what are the lessons that you could share with us uh, from that regard? Thank you. Thanks so much, Andrea. Kerry, I'll let you answer that question first, if you'd like, and then if you've got anything to add for Holly's question. Um, and then I think certainly I'd like to respond to Holly and possibly Dylan would like to and Sean as well. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Andrea. Yeah, I, I'm aware of the Bellum statement and actually there are some good collaborations between South Africa and Brazil. In particular, I have a PhD student shared with, um, with someone in Brazil who's helping to develop capacity in taxonomy of our deep water coral species, but also through some of the regional projects. In terms of the, the oil and gas, I was nodding and I was smiling and I was thinking about um, some of the more innovative measures I had to use to build relationships with the oil and gas industry. Um, but really it comes down to those individuals and, and the, one, the one particular person who I, I kind of nicknamed our Seamount after was just someone that um, kind of understood. He used to spend a lot of his off time, even though he's an oil executive, spent his off time in, in nature and in game reserves like the Kruger National Park. And so he, he said to me, I, I get what you're trying to do. And, um, yeah, it, it, by slowly, slowly building projects, I, I was telling some of the, the One Ocean Hub team members, I even did things like helping oil executives, kids with school projects on shells. So I would say you don't have to die, but you do have to step out of your, your comfort zone to sometimes get that data. Um, but I also think that we need to work across government departments to make sure that the right permits are in place and the procedures in place. And, we have been making some progress in, in acquiring shared information through collaborations. We've also done some cooperative research projects 
And I think that's a really important model for strengthening knowledge and capacity in South Africa to, to maybe make use of the vessels and work with industry. Um, it, it saves costs for industry too, because they can have someone experienced out there instead of necessarily hiring someone or bringing someone from another country, they can draw from local expertise. And for example, deep water corals or identifying sensitive ecosystems and, and that kind of approach. Thanks, Kerry. And um, Holly, maybe just to pick up on this idea of the less tangible, and Kerry's just given an example of how the sort of intangible relationship building that happens even amongst these negotiations. So I think that this really is a critical area at the moment in ocean governance, and I'm going to ask Dylan to speak a little bit more about this, and perhaps Elisa also wants to come in, because the one area that is attempting to make some headway here is around the idea of customary law and how you take intangible heritage into account in policy. Some of the work that we've been doing in South Africa as the One Ocean Hub is thinking quite seriously about how you attempt to make kind of uh, translation devices between science and um, sort of the canons of how policy is made and in terms of how spiritual and cultural ideas of the ocean can at least find a way in which they can start to have a conversation because currently that's not happening. So in most of the policies, especially when there's applications for oil and gas drilling, the one of the reasons for them to not uh, be allowed to explore or to stop the drilling would be if they found marine heritage, which are all based on sort of material artifacts. But certainly in our country and in many around the world, there are intangible beliefs and cultural heritage, living heritage around the oceans and the coasts, which are also being damaged and harmed from some of this activity. So it's a critical question about how those interests are listened to. How do they, as Dylan said, start to be taken as seriously as a concern and a competing concern, actually, compared to just economic livelihood or, or looking for resources in, in the oceans. So Dylan, Annalisa, I don't know if you'd like to add to that point. I, I would love, love to. Thanks, Kira. I'm going to keep my video off because my internet's a bit shaky. Can you hear me? Um, I hope so. Uh, so I just wanted to say that um, I thought of some of the barriers, Holly, like just off, off the cuff, because there's quite a few, but one was um, the lack of like legitimate, legitimate spaces for people to share their meanings and values of the ocean. We have, we don't have many spaces in which these can be negotiated. So one space to that is actually just creating new ones and not relying on the old, the old ones um, or the, the current established systems for these, these, um, questions to be negotiated. So what's needed is kind of a, a meaningful dialogical process. And I think one of the responses is any practices that can engage empathy um, between different groups and empathy being a very powerful tool in this. Um, so one of, the, one of the ways in which you can create these translations is one of the allies we can have in this work is around ocean governance and intangible heritage is working with artists and cultural practitioners and have we, we have a whole region uh, looking at our funding program to support artists in helping in this negotiation of making um, the intangible at least somewhat tangible through storytelling through music and dance and um, other forms of embodied practices and um, we've been experimenting for some time with theater. We developed a methodology called Empitheater, as well as um, we moving into film and animation as a way to make these invisible uh, meanings of the ocean visible to policymakers, scientists, and other uh, knowledge practitioners. And, um, and I think one of the is kind of colonial idea of universe, especially in legal processes and governances, this idea that there's um, like a universal truth and but we're moving more and more into understanding that there's multiple truths and a plural uh, resonant world um, and that there's these really interesting relationships and it's about um, kind of creating entrances and exits between these different worldviews through 
um, working in, in solidarity with artists and storytellers and other creative practitioners and the cultural practitioners themselves who, who carry this knowledge. Um, and so I suppose one of the ways we respond is rather than trying to make policies that are often kind of, if we imagine the responses to create something for a solo pianist, we actually wanting to create policies that are, are writing music for orchestras, for many different instruments to be able to, to play this response or this plan or this policy, not just a single solo soloist and so not just a single beneficiary, but many. Um, but yeah, I would, I would love to follow up on, on that question even more, but I'll leave it there. It's a wonderful question. Thanks, Holly. Thanks, Bill. Elisa? Yeah, just to compliment and say, yeah, I think, you know, there are legal barriers as well to having these um, different values recognized. And I think for, for, the, for those holding those values to feel that um, they have actually legal entitlements to have their concerns um, voiced and heard in decision making around the conservation and use of the ocean. I mean, those of you who on this call are familiar with the Convention on the Law of the Sea, and you know that while there's recognition of multiple values, there are some aspects that maybe are not as um, addressed in as much detail as others. And I think the questions about intangible her heritage, uh, uh, customary laws, traditional knowledge, those are not necessarily themes that we find explicitly addressed uh, under the Convention on, on the Law of the Sea. Um, however, many of you may also be familiar with the Convention on Biological Diversity, which has done a lot of work on marine biodiversity, and of course has done a lot of work also in terms of understanding the contributions and the need for protection of the traditional knowledge um, and sustainable um, customary practices of indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, and we, we know as international lawyers that all those parties to the CBD are also parties to UNCLOS and they are expected to implement their international obligation in a mutually supportive manner. So one way, one, one thing the Ocean Hub is exploring, but also other lawyers around the world is understanding what that means, what governments and other um, actors at the national level need to do um, to really ensure both the conservation of the ocean and sustainable use of the ocean, including marine biodiversity, but also respecting and, and maximizing the opportunities to learn for the benefit of conservation and sustainable use from traditional practices, traditional beliefs, um, and traditional knowledge. And more and more we see how that traditional knowledge internationally, although maybe in different ways nationally, is recognized as an equal source um, of knowledge in, in decision-making processes. Um, and I think the, the other thing that, that I would like to contribute from, from a, a legal perspective, what Dylan was saying about what are the spaces for these different international regimes um, to be implemented at the national level and for different groups that have maybe different um, stakes uh, in some of the elements that are protected internationally to have a dialogue. Um, and one of the things we're looking into at the One Ocean Hub, but many of you may be very familiar with, is how environmental impact assessments may be processes where we could have a dialogue about different um, uh, tangible and intangible values of the oceans. The more easily monetized one, they may have to do with uh, well-known uses of the ocean, be that you know, offshore oil and gas or mining or fishing, um, but also the other values, cultural, spiritual values, uh, small-scale fishing uses, um, and how those environmental impact assessments can move from um, a process that's often very uh, driven by damage limitation and damage control, limiting negative impacts to a process where instead we can, we can try and all put our heads together and think about maximizing benefits for different groups. Um, and, and really understanding in the balancing that Kerry mentioned, how in what ways different groups that come to the table with their own agenda and, and are there to push that agenda forward, how through the process they can learn better where other people are coming from and how there may be opportunities to, to cooperate and identify uh, common grounds. And I think what Kerry shared earlier around understanding fine-grained priorities with oil and gas, through that engagement also getting, as Andre was highlighting, into a place where you can collaborate and share data because you finally find a common agenda to work towards. And ideally going even forward, but making through the process 
um, giving voice to those that usually are not sitting at that table. We saw the picture from Kerry's presentation of oil, rep oil industry representatives and marine scientists, but we didn't see uh, many other uh, community representatives who, who would have felt equally vested in whatever the decision would have been, either regarding uh, creating a marine protected area or going ahead with an oil and gas um, offshore project. So EIAs could provide that opportunity, but they do require, I think, some uh, additional work, be that in how legislation at the national level is implemented or is framed and the practices around it and how, for instance, EIA consultants see their role and, and may facilitate dialogue and, you know, including information and knowledge from different sources or not. To including that point that Dylan made about involving artists and ways in which people can not only engage in these um, negotiations in a very um, kind of rational and maximizing outputs way, but in a, in a more empathic way to learn from others and, un and understand their position. And through that, move maybe uh, in a space when they can be more open to co-develop solutions together. Thanks so much, Elisa. We've got two more questions. Um, Aditya has asked in the chat, and Kirsty, I will hand over to uh, in a minute to ask a question of Kerry. But the one question, Kerry, coming from Aditya is, how responsive is the government of South Africa to scientific papers? And what are the challenges besides a sort of bureaucratic issue? And then if we can just give Kirsty a chance to ask her question, because you may want to answer it together. So Kirsty, can I hand over to you? Hi, yes, sorry. Um, I just wanted to ask, it's a much simpler question, but I guess what are the key kind of um, bits of advice if you had to distill it all down um, if someone wanted to engage in policy like a scientist or a social scientist or whatever, what would be the key um, pieces of advice that you would give? Thanks. Thanks both. Um, so, so the first question, that's quite complicated. Um, overall, I mean, the South African government is respectful of science. Science um, receives a substantial portion of funding and scientists, yeah, scientists are often listened to, but they're not usually the loudest voice. That's what I can say. Um, I think in, in the work to take this forward, one of the key lessons, if I can blend the responses together, for me was we really needed to invest earlier in communication and in shepherding this network of protected areas through cabinets, we, we really needed a strong science base. So that was critical. And I had a very strong network of scientists, like probably more than 30 scientists that contributed into this work. So there was a strong science foundation. But um, what we didn't do well was to articulate the need for protected areas and, and maybe the benefits well until we until quite late in the process and i think that was one of the key things that unlocked things in cabinets so you know talking to policy makers you need to be very brief and it's the opposite of what you would normally do when you give a scientific explanation and and i think that the power of like the imagery and showing people has been very very important and Minister Malewa, our environment minister, who, who, who was at the helm for much of, much of the time when, when we were trying to move these marine protected areas forward, she under, understood what Sean was saying, that it's not only the exciting things, it's also the boring things. And, and the one day I was amazed when she had a meeting with ExxonMobil and she was talking to them about the MITs. And um, I had given her slideshows about the various areas and she actually brought up slideshows and she also had that sense of wonder and was showing people the giant spider crabs in the mud and, and she was talking about this in her response to, to the oil and gas industry. So I think that's a, a critical element um, and we, we faced serious communication challenges um, in terms of other lessons is when you want to make a change like this or, or achieve something difficult, you need to remember that this kind of work is, is really, 
I, I like to use the analogy of an ocean crossing. It's not a harbor race. It's really a long game. So you need to, to work at it for a long time and you need to slow down and prepare for that. You need to understand more deeply and, and then you need to be willing to compromise. It is a compromise, you know, I didn't get everything that I set out to, to get. Um, and we had to make many balanced compromises. And then, and then working with principles in that balancing act was, was really important. Thanks so much, Kerry. And I see Holly has also picked up on the point of the EIAs, talking about how do we move towards more innovative methods that have holistic and realistic representations of ocean values and impacts. So again, Sean's question about how do we start to, to value other ways of experiencing and having relationships with the ocean. Um, Dylan has also put in the chat, if you would like, a link to one of the projects in South Africa that the One Ocean Hub has been working on that used a form of theater as storytelling, collecting stories of coastal people and the meanings that they attach to the oceans. Um, from scientists, from Sangomas, from marine educators, and to fishers as well. So if you're interested, you're welcome to have a look. Um, Joe, I wonder if I could just call attention in the chat, there's also one of the fellows is trying to get in but can't connect. I don't know if you can see them waiting in the waiting room. Thanks, Kira. Um, there isn't anybody showing in the waiting room just now. Okay. Um, I just admitted somebody uh, maybe f two or three minutes ago. Uh, okay, no problem. Thanks. Maybe uh, maybe they'll try again in a bit. Any other questions or comments someone has? Or perhaps there's also something you'd like to share from your own experiences that you think would enrich the discussion. Nothing yet? Yeah, this is uh, Valentina, and I apologize because I haven't been able to identify how to raise my hand, see the technological <laughs> bar barriers that we <laughs> have to face. And no I wonder if, it, if it's uh, uh, apologies for butting in like this. <laughs> um, and let me put my video on. Um, see, I'm surrounded by my um, children's art here. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> um, here and uh, this is Valentina. I work for the Division for Ocean Affairs and Law of the Sea, and uh, uh, I am the uh, project manager of the UN Nippon Foundation uh, Fellowship Programs and the Alumni uh, Network. Um, so maybe while other people might think about some of their uh, additional questions, I, I'll, I'll take advantage of this pause to first of all thank Elisa and uh, One Ocean Hub and all the vast uh, number of collaborators that they have across the world and today's presenters in particular for uh, sharing uh, this wonderful uh, set of images and, and stories and expertise uh, with us. Um, we are uh, here, or I am, here in New York uh, in a lockdown for about 10 weeks and uh, seeing, you know, locked in a small New York apartment surrounded by my children's art. That's why it's not really the usual office environment. <laughs> and I want to really thank Carrie for um, um, bringing us back to the ocean and uh, allowing us after uh, such a long time right now, exactly locked up in these uh, small uh, spaces, to go with our imagination to the uh, to the ocean. So, <laughs> first of all, that uh, very uh, personal thank, um, and then again, thank you to Elisa and uh, and the Hub for uh, organizing these activities for uh, our alumni. I know that also many of them are in similar uh, lockdowns, and uh, we have tried to imagine ways to continue our activities with them and continue to uh, uh, build their awareness and our awareness and their capacity. So um, exactly, just a moment to say thank you to all of you and for sharing uh, this um, 
innovative ways of thinking of science and uh, science policy interface. We talk a lot about that in uh, our programs and at the UN in general, as you can imagine these days. Um, but it's very interesting to start thinking about additional components that, is, that are not just the uh, natural physical sciences and policy, but also the human sciences. Um, as humans, we are, uh, or we believe we are at the center of anything and everything, and yet it appears that we never really factor in all these more uh, cultural and spiritual and personal experiences that come from our relationship to the ocean and uh, many other things. So thank you very much for bringing all of us uh, to, the, to the forefront. So there wasn't a question there, but a lot of thanks. Thank you, Valentina, thank you. That's really lovely to hear. Um, yeah, I, I have nothing more to add to that except that for me, this has been an incredible journey of research, looking exactly the kind of uh, things you're talking about. Um, what are our relationships to the sea? And in fact, in our research project, the question that we asked all participants, it didn't matter who they were, uh, one was actually an ex-minister as well, was what are your earliest memories of the sea? What are your first memories of the ocean? And it's just incredible how so many people have very moving uh, memories that kind of have shaped their experience and their awe and wonder of the oceans as they've moved into adulthood and all sorts of different fields. I uh, want to just call attention because we have got some more questions in the chat. Let me just go back to that. And here I think what we could do maybe is uh, Sean, Dylan, Kerry and Elisa, if very briefly you'd like to answer this, but it's from Andrea again from Brazil asking, and, and he's right, this is a sort of communication challenge that we have here. So what kind of tools have worked really well in your experience? When have you felt like you've, you've got through? And Kerry to some extent have really said storytelling. Um, so maybe Sean, would you like to t talk from your experience and then Dylan and then Kerry? So the question is about what tools, what tools in our experience really work? Um, I think for, for me as a, as a social scientist and economist, what really works is acknowledging that uh, livelihood values and economic values are linked to to ocean systems and to try and find ways to develop um, so things such as a fishing industry. I'll give an example. We have um, a small scale uh, fishery in the UK and an area was closed to scallop dredges in order to allow the shell fisheries to benefit from that. And it was a, a huge uh, legal challenge to get the area closed. But that was nearly 12 years ago and in the 12 years since that site has been closed people who are mortal enemies in the initial stages of the closure have now formed this most wonderful fisher science partnership which is based around um, economics ecology and social sciences so we asked the question how are people's well-being influenced how, is, how are people's pockets influenced and how has the environment changed and through that constant um, feedback and using the, the local boats as um, research vessels as well, we just create this partnership of shared understanding. And it, it can't just be the ecology, it has to be the understanding of how that influences change within a community as well. Thanks, Sean. Dylan? Um, thanks. I mentioned it earlier, but Andrea, the biggest tool I think that we could work with is empathy. Um, I think it's a very powerful, um, if we see it as a tool, in building relationships um, and also friendships. I've noticed that, you know, when we use, we, I mainly work in theatre, but when we use theatre to tell a story about what's actually going on, we can the story at once. And people tell the story without judgment. They go deep into the immersive st stories that it renders you defenseless. You 
you can you can do your agenda quite easily if you're trying to just talk hard facts. But when you talk about the emotional connection to the ocean and uh, long-lived livelihoods and stories and meanings of the ocean, it's much harder to defend certain ways of thinking or being. So I found empathy and any practice that can encourage empathy, any tool that can do that, which is usually the arts, um, is a very, very powerful. I've been very powerful in some of our other projects where we've been able to kind of make meaningful changes in very local, practical ways as well as policy. And I think from my end, I think there's also legal tools that we can use to, to have stronger communication or, or potentially more persuasive communication. And going back to the point I was making earlier about different areas of international law that we can bring together uh, in addressing ocean challenges, as well as the, uh, the complex balancing act uh, in understanding opportunities for ocean conservation and sustainable use. I think one key area of international law that we can all engage more is uh, international human rights law. And this is an area where we have recognition of multiple values, including uh, the intangible values, uh, when we have a lot of legal reasoning and tools for balancing. I mean, of course, it's not a silver bullet, but it's also an area where different um, stakeholders can feel that they are empowered to ask questions or to challenge or, or to be heard, and where other um, members of the community, be that you know, judges, um, human rights advocates and activists, um, uh, monitoring authorities and others can also understand better their own obligations uh, to listen to different voices and, um, and support effective communication on the different needs and science that we're looking at to take decisions. And, and I saw, Sheku, you had in the chat a few really important reflections about climate, climate change impacts and opportun you know, the approaches to climate mitigation and adaptation and how that may affect negatively particular, particular sectors of ocean constituencies, including uh, communities, um, the question of poverty too. And I think these are all matters that are becoming more and more addressed in human rights terms, uh, in terms of climate justice, uh, poverty looked in terms of human rights as a way to address these issues not only as socioeconomic ones, but also in legal terms and, you know, giving a harder legal edge to those issues uh, as, you know, governments um, are balancing with other uh, international and national um, obligations. So I think that there's one thing that we are looking into is to what extent using human rights in those negotiations can help bring a broader group of people to the negotiating table and maybe giving more attention to those voices that are not usually um, heard as much, and particularly the voices of those that are most uh, vulnerable to climate change impacts and to uh, the negative impacts of our own decisions on ocean conservation and sustainable use. Um, and in fact, human rights law also has a very strong branch related to the rights of children and how children are the, mo are the most affected by any mistake we make, I think, in environmental management and conservation, and particularly marine, um, both because right now, because of their early phase of physical and mental development, the, the impacts are stronger on them, where they have less um, resilience than grown-ups do, but also because they'll have a longer time in which they will be affected by those negative impacts um, as their development continues and their time frame is 50 year down the line, 70 year down the line, which is actually a time frame that is more aligned with that of nature and biodiversity and ecosystems. And so human rights law really both um, gives children a voice just now, not just as future decision maker or stakeholders, but right now governments who are party to the Convention on the Human Rights of the Child are expected to involve children in decision making uh, and this can be very powerful voices and very important, but also critically to make sure that their, their own concerns and vulnerabilities are taken into account in environmental uh, impact assessments and decision making. So I think there's an opportunity there for scientists, um, lawyers and social scientists who work around ocean conservation and sustainable use to, to use for communication purposes, but also for building alliances, um, human rights to give those voices the, the attention they need and for us to learn from them and, and be better at our own job. Go for it, Kiri. Thanks. 
Um, I think that's the, the, there's a really important link there to, to the rights of the child and, um, and the decisions that get made in government. And in fact, one of my most important communication lessons is to bring future generations into the room. So just to reflect on Andrea's uh, question about our communication strategy, I'm trying to write up my lessons. We invested a lot in understanding the audience, uh, which was cabinet, South Africa's cabinet, and the factors that had previously influenced decision making. And one of those that emerged very strongly is, is the, the impacts on future generations. And so we put a lot of imagery of children into, um, into our website, into our communication products, into our brochures that we took into cabinets, and into a film. And um, the film, the film had a lot of um, emotion in it, it had empathy in it, it had national pride in it. So those were all also important elements in, in that work. But, but Joe, like all good communication efforts, you do need to understand your audience in preparing what you're doing. And, and we, we studied that to look at our cases and future generations, economic sense, um, and then framing the work as practical solutions were, were actually key messages that we, we distilled out through, through research. Perhaps I can just add to that because there's a lot of really interesting uh, both statements and questions coming up in the chat and we're starting to run out of time. But, you know, EIA processes, legal processes, uh, research, scientific papers that are really showing evidence in which change needs to happen. I think one of the most important things to recognize if you're trying to uh, both communicate but attempt to change policy nationally and internationally is that it's impossible for any one of those fields to do it alone. So one of the most useful strategies that we found is thinking very carefully and carefully crafting and building your network of allies. And those allies can be unusual bedfellows sometimes. So allies can be scientists, allies can be politicians, allies can be activists. So I think that uh, it's not just in the sort of form in which you want to communicate, whether it's film, music, theater, scientific papers, more importantly, who's the network? Who's the person that's going to get you the in? Um, actually, Kerry is one of our people that gets us the in sometimes when we know that she sits on the marine spatial planning uh, body, then Kerry's an ally. And we hope sometimes that we can be her ally in getting her message across in different ways. So for me, one of the important things is thinking through your network. What's, what is your strategy? How's your network working uh, in solidarity, even if you're working in different ways towards an end? Um, I think that we may have to wrap up, and I'm really sorry about that because I think we could probably go on for much longer. What we will do, and Joe's just reminded me, is that the video of this will be available. It can get emailed if you're interested in it. And I know certainly myself and I'm sure some of the other panelists, if you would like to email us directly if you have further questions, or you want more information on some of the specific uh, points that we raised, we'd be happy to take those. So just to say thank you so much for, my, for myself. What a fantastic event. Uh, I stayed awake the whole time. I've been on Zooms where that can be hard, but this has been really exciting. So I'd like to just say uh, thanks once more and hand over to Lisa to do the close. Yes, no, thank you so much. I also really enjoyed myself and, and learned a lot. I can see that the discussion has really picked up in the chat and I'm sure other colleagues who haven't had a chance to speak have benefited and, and I would very much encourage them to stay in touch with us if they have any specific questions or interest in our own research. Um, please reach out. Uh, I know as you um, subscribe for this event, you'll have now received um, One Ocean Hub newsletters so don't be strangers. We really, I think a lot of our work and, and you know, for us to make sure that our research is relevant is very much keeping a dialogue with you and understanding the, the research you are doing or the challenges you're facing 
and bringing them back into our own research to make sure we complement and address questions that are shared across uh, different countries. Um, I think as, um, as an international lawyer, and just to bring in a few other points that have been made, and thinking also about the, the role that Strathclyde and the One Ocean Hub hope to, um, uh, to play vis-a-vis -vis the Nippon Fellow, uh, Fellowship Program and our collaboration with Yuan Doalos, is really thinking as a lawyer what I have learned from these exchanges for, for my own work. And on the one hand, it's really understanding the real world challenges in implementing international law and the law of the sea, particularly those bits that you think wouldn't necessarily be very controversial. I mean, we have very clear, beautiful provisions in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, on the importance of marine science, of sharing scientific information, and obligations related to scientific cooperation. I mean, all of these obligations are should be non-controversial. Um, non They're very clear. They make perfect sense. And yet, when you understand the, the challenges of ocean research, how much we don't know, and, and as Kerry said, how much having access to technologies or not, how much building real relationships and actually friendships among researchers from different countries is crucial for us to advance on, you know, building that knowledge um, base that can allow us to then take this decisions on the ocean, it's, it's a lot more than, you know, what those provisions in the Convention on the Law of the Sea can convey. Uh, a question of costs, who has the budget, how these budgets are used, how many colleagues from across the world can benefit from the financing that is going into ocean research, particularly deep sea research, um, and how the capacity and technologies are built is really important. And there are processes like the BB&J negotiations where we hear from scientists and where the policymakers are, of course, in contact with researchers in their own countries to try and make sure that um, the new international law of the sea we're developing is responsive. But I think much more dialogue and, and, and documentation of lessons learned needs to happen. And the more as researchers and practitioners, we can exchange ideas and learn from each other, like I think the exchange with Andre about the experience in, in Brazil, I think the more we can all think more realistically and creatively about what it takes to realize those obligations of the law of the sea on science. Equally, I think we, we made some good points here and there about the importance of general principles of international environmental law and the law of the sea. A precaution has been mentioned a few times. And of course, understanding from Kerry how much we don't know about the oceans and how much the fact that we don't know means that we need to protect and, and develop more knowledge and how Sean said how they're both the wondrous unique features, but there's also the commonplace features in the oceans and of ocean life that are critical for our continued well-being on Earth. All of that just shows how, how much as, as policymakers we need to seriously engage with the idea of precaution and working with an ever-evolving but, but still significantly limited scientific understanding of all the mysteries uh, in the ocean. Um, maybe another point, both around precaution and scientific cooperation, I think is the role of uh, reaching out to non-public bodies and, and the private sector. They have more means and information that is crucial for our shared purposes and the ways in which we do that, be that through communication, but also uh, those individual relationships that we can build. And again, how then what we learn from that to share that more for other um, colleagues around the world to, to you know, to, to increase their success in creating those collaborations. Um, and the final point is exactly that, that legal thinking that we still need to do and the practice around how we can bring together the law of the sea with international biodiversity law, international human rights law, international law and cultural heritage, and finding the, not only the challenges to those areas, but also solutions. How as lawyers, we can be more creative and, and bold in, in reading together these areas of law and find solutions and showing to governments how this work is not made more complex by multiple sources of obligations, but in fact comes together. We have opportunities for policy coherence and um, for, um, I think, integrated approaches if we think about all these areas of law together. And we, and we try and learn from the innovations that each area of law may have uh, come up with. So ideas that human rights lawyers may have come up with, 
biodiversity lawyers and love the sea lawyers, so to say. So I think exchanges like today are one way to do it. And for lawyers, of course, not to speak just among themselves, but with uh, colleagues in the marine sciences and social scientists and artists is, um, I think has been really already very transformational for me. And, and we hope to learn more and more how we can do that through the One Ocean Hub and, and interactions with you. So I think we've reached the very end of our session for today. I hope that we will stay in touch and hopefully see many of you at the sister se a session we will organize on social sciences and the ocean science and policy interface in a few weeks. Um, so do keep in touch and, uh, and we hope to see you very soon. And thank you so much for participating today.